all these verbs so who who's translating so the uh, the translator should who is proficient in both languages the language in which uh, the original text was written and the language into which it is going to be translated so the translator should be well versed should be well versed should know both the languages very well so the idea of translation where did it emerge from where did it come from we see that in ancient times the ideas and insights that were used in different places this got transmitted from traders from travelers from tradesmen when they started visiting one country to another or one part of the country to another part when they started moving they involved in this translation where things were getting transferred from culture to culture so we understand that in the development of world culture translation played a very 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 important role and translation especially is defined as facilitating something that is written what is written in one language is translated is brought down is carried across to another language okay so um, as i told you earlier in the uh, development of world culture this translation plays a very very important role and we understand that uh, while translation takes place interpretation also takes place uh, people start interpreting interpreting is another um, form of translation actually it is a sub category of translation interpreting is considered as a sub category of translation and uh, mainly you know re religious purposes for religious purposes translation actually began translation originated uh, when there was a need to translate the holy scriptures for example the bible which was originally written the latin version of bible was translated into many vernacular languages it was trans it has a multiple uh, english translations and then the buddhist transcription uh, buddhist scriptures the holy texts of buddha that was translated from indian languages into chinese and uh, the second uh, translation the famous ones are the greek philosophical and scientific works from greek and syriac into arabic so we understand that religion played a very important role in the development of translation so now coming to these two terms interpretation and um, translation we can consider both as same only but the different lies in the skills that are required to do these two things see you do translation you do interpretation so while you are doing interpretation and translation you need different skills to do these two things for translators for translation it needs extensive practice you need a lot of practice in the subject areas you have to know how to compile things you have to know how to compile a text how to uh, manage the glossaries the of relevant terminologies how to you know bring about the meanings and uh, the words that are the new words that you come across that are used in translation so a translator should be an expert expertized person in compiling and managing glossaries of the relevant terminologies of that particular subject and the person should also be skilled or given training in acquiring computer assisted translation software tools a translator should be trained in using cat software tools cat is the abbreviation for computer assisted translation some of the translation tools are omega t barricat vertal etc you can find all these thing on the internet and some of the familiar tools that you must be knowing is the spell checks you know that we come across on mobiles and even typing and all the spell check grammar check and then the predictive text that are on so we need to um acquire skill in word processes desktop desktop publishing systems 
graphics presentation software etc etc okay so this is needed for translators whereas for the interpreters they need better training in listening skills they need to memorize see when a person is talking when a person is presenting an oration then the listening skills of the person who is going to translate that is most important so the person has to listen and then um, you know given some time for him to take over the things that were spoken note taking techniques that he must be proficient in and um, all these things are needed for the interpreters some time also will be given to them to listen to the person talking and then taking notes and then producing it okay so translation is nothing but reproducing okay so it involves two important process which is two important processes which are decoding and reencoding so this is given on page 6 sir decoding what is decoding decoding the meaning of the source text st so we already saw what st is what uh, uh, t um, i mean source text the language from which we are going to translate the text uh, which is written in the original language source text and the target text okay target text means the language into which we are going to translate so d and typing a text and interpreting it and giving it to form recoding uh, re encoding okay re encoding means converting it into a coded form so two important processes involved in translations are decoding and re encoding right so for this you please keep in mind these two important words st and tt Tar, uh, st is the source text which comes from the source language and target language target text okay so the goal of translation is usually to bring about an equivalence between these two text we have the source text source text na and like the original uh, text in which the original language in which the first version is written that is the source text then you have the target language in which we are going to translate so we should see to it when the person is translating they should ensure that both the texts give away the same message both the texts should bring about come come with the same message it can either be word to word translation translation la there are different possibilities word to word translation sense for sense translation so when we are adopting these different methods we have to be very very careful because they say that language is arbitrary language can confuse us because language is not based on any reason see for why we are telling language is arbitrary why we are telling that it is not based on any reason is for example this word cat let us take the example of the word cat this word cat can mean an animal okay and it could also mean any other animal if we imagine the cat the real cat that we are meaning about then it is a cat suppose we call a camel also a cat or any other animal or a human being as a cat then we are led to confusion there so that is why they say language is arbitrary and languages are different from one another it is only the mixing of sounds okay languages are different from one another because it is the it is only the mixing of sounds that give different words and meaning so they mix the words in different ways to make structural patterns that is why they say languages are different from one another and languages are used to reflect human perceptions languages are mirrors for reflecting human thoughts the way we express ourselves the way we talk how we see things how we perceive things so that is why they say because language has all these characteristics that it is arbitrary it they are different from one another they reflect human thoughts because of all these characteristics of language 
the person who is involved in translating should be proficient in both the languages they say okay so now coming to the history of translation why should we study the history of translation why translation is needed at all so the reasons that are given on page 8 for the history of translation is why is translation needed means because we need a better understanding of the world's culture in the era of globalization translation has contributed to civilization and development of all cultural and intellectual life so it is translation which has given a better understanding of the world that is why translation is needed and uh, we always regard translation as an independent discipline that is why it is pertinent for us to know its history it is important for us to know its history because we regard translation as a independent discipline and um, the cultural heritage see we are living in an era of globalization we know uh, the world's culture so for the development and transmission of cultural heritage it is possible only by translation european culture with its great wealth of knowledge has transmitted its cultural heritage world over how is this possible because of the efforts of the translators from all over the world a culture gets transmitted gets known to the people all over the world only with the help of translation so translation is a fundamental human activity where ideas and insights have been shared from culture to culture so there are different lines of approach to translation the earlier system of translation was established within the roman tradition it is the romans the um, uh, the great uh, personalities cicero and horace it is from them that uh, the the uh, this thing was established the tradition of translation was established so we have two possibilities of translating word for word translation sense for sense translation so this word for word translation has been a point for debate for a long time which one is better kind of so there has been a, there have been a numerous uh, attempts at classifying okay so the first important classification that we have to look at is george steiner's classification of translation george steiner in one of his, in in his uh, writings after babel divides the history of translation into four periods he divides the history of translation into four periods that is given on page 10 in your uh, book so uh, the first period the first period extends with the statements given by cicero and horace the two romans on translation so it was with the pub so starting from horace and cicero it extends up to alexander fraser titler's essay on the principles of translation which was written in 1791 so the first period of translation is from cicero to horace to alexander titler's that essay okay that is a very important uh, essay written by titler which contributed enormously for translation and the second period is uh, from uh, the second period is with the publication of lobert suler invocation de saint jerome which came in 1946 so this marked the development of theory in translation uh where different methodologies of approaching translations emerged so it is only in the second period that uh, different em- uh, methodologies came up in translation and then the third period is in the 1940s from 1940s itself where you know machines were assisted machines were assisting in the process of translation machine translation the fourth period coexisted with the third and it had its origin in early 1960s so this again included a wide uh, framework where 
you had the study of literary texts um uh, it it involved a number of disciplines also such as classical philology comparative literature lexical statistics ethnography so you see as students of literature you all should be knowing these terms what is this classical philology classical refers to the classical text the greek and roman texts and the, you know the classical texts of ancient times and the contemporary times so philology philology means the study of literary texts you have comparative literature comparative literature different uh, uh, com uh, comparing literatures written in different languages written in different countries etc etc and then the lexical statistics the words involved and then the ethnography the culture the sociology of class speech etc then the rhetorics formal rhetorics rhetorics means the speech delivered to impress people the poetics the terminologies that are involved in poetics study of grammar etc so george steiner's this classification given in his book after babel has divided the entire thing into four periods and um, right from cicero to present and we see that these this division is based on chronological structure so what is chronology chronology means based on history the dates it follows the dates so we saw like it started with cicero and horace and then 1791 1940 1946 so it is chronological structure without making any clear cut divisions and then now coming to the romans uh, the romans so many critics believe translation to be a roman invention so many critics believe that the romans only started this translation it was the starting point for focusing attention on the development of translation why why because translation did not exist in the ancient days and the west also the western countries also did not have systematically formulated arguments to develop translation they did not have the theories practices etc so it was these romans cicero and horace who actually influenced translation so the important contribution that cicero and horace made is the distinction between word for word translation and sense for sense translation they emphasized on the aesthetic criteria of the target language so what is the target language the language in which we are going to translate suppose we are going to translate an english work to tamil english work is called as a source text or source language and the text which is going to get translated into tamil is the target language target language is tamil so this uh, aesthetic criteria should definitely take a place in this they say so the target language whatever is translated should not be a blind imitation of the source language just like that a slavish imitation should not be done that is what is emphasized here so the original text uh, that is the source language the source text should not lose its aestheticness it should not lose its beauty in the sense it should not lose the pleasure giving aspect now a translator should not make slavish translation just a blind translation a slave, a slave uh, he should not be a slave to the rules of translation and there but because when the rules are followed so meticulously when we say these are the aspects that should find a place in translation and when a translator is going to blindly imitate then what will happen is in the process of translation the beauty of the original text will be lost the aesthetic aspect of language will be lost so what the translators are advised is they should take aestheticness into 
consideration and they should also take context into consideration in the sense that the translations the work that they are going to translate can be adapted to suit their culture their context so this is what the roman authors did starting from cicero to and horace these roman authors took up to translation and adaptation so when they translated the greek text textbooks they adapted to suit their culture their need their context and uh, thus they differentiated themselves from latin literature their work was distinct from latin literature so the important point is roman translations emphasized on the independence of the translated text they stated that the translated text is independent from the original text the autonomy or independence of the translated text was given emphasis here they did not emphasize on the importance of equivalent meanings that is word to word translation or sense to sense translation so they took up to translation and adaptation and only emphasized on a general semantic and stylistic correspondence hope you all know what is semantics semantics referring to the meaning the stylistic correspondence so they did not give importance to equivalent meaning but they were keen on showing the translated text as an autonomous text showing the translation as an independent text so as i told you early uh the the religion played a very important role in uh, translation especially the spread of christianity uh it gathered momentum uh, the dissemination of bible bible was made available easy to everybody so it is with the spread of christianity came another important role for translation especially uh with uh, pope damasus he is the first person to have commissioned for translating bible in 384 ad so saint jerome translated bible from hebrew into latin so the first translation by translated edition came from saint jerome it was commissioned by pope damasus so it was translated from hebrew into latin here cicero's model was followed so um, uh, saint jerome had adopted the roman's model cicero's model he adopted sense for sense translation see uh, we already saw that there were two possibilities of translation word for word translation sense for sense translation so here saint jerome did not opt for did not go for word for word translation he went for sense for sense translation so even now even in the contemporary period from the middle from the middle ages into the renaissance even now we still follow sense for sense translation only okay it will be a sense for sense translation and not word for word translation because they considered word for word translation as a very mechanical one so they avoided that and went for sense for sense translation so the first complete bible translation was made by wycliffe bible so this was the uh, this first complete bible translation is the wycliffe bible which was made between 1380 and 1384 after this wycliffe bible a number of english translations had come up a number of in, uh, translations in the vernacular languages came up why it is translated in english because john wycliffe stated that every man should understand this holy text in his own language in his local language that is why uh when it was translated from hebrew into latin wycliffe like people wycliffe and his followers 
attempted in translating this holy bible into vernacular languages into the local languages because they felt that uh, reading bible in latin would be difficult in understanding for the local people the, for the local people and for the layman so they made it still easier for even the local people to understand it that is why they attempted at translating into english so wycliffe was attacked for this because people considered that translating bible from latin was an unholy thing it was like removing the sanctity or holiness of the text it was a heretical practice they said so it was heresy heresy means unhel unholy so they denounced or they criticized the followers of wycliffe as low lords but anyway uh, wycliffe and his followers kept on uh, doing this kind of translation and later on his disciple wycliffe's disciple called uh, john perve revised this and it came in 1408 so the second wycliffe bible uh, that is um, which came in 1395 to 96 in the prologue of that bible the process of of translation itself was described some four points are given uh, for describing the process of translation how translation has have to be how translation has to be that itself is described in that prologue where they say translation should be a collaborative effort it should establish authentic latin source it should be a comparison of the different versions it should explain in easy terms the hard or complex words and it should also translate the tra uh, sentence meaning should be very close to the source text so we see that these exercises of translations started as a religious exercise in the west initially why people started translating people translated because they wanted to read bible in their local language so it initially started as a religious exercise then in the 16th century with the advent of printing new dimensions emerged after wycliffe's version it was william tyndale's version in 1525 with the arrival of new testament new testament was written by tyndale it is again a translation of the bible william tyndale uh, tyndale's intention was to make clear even to ordinary man even to the layman uh, bible should be made clear without any obscurities without any difficulties of the latin language but for this act of for this act of translating the bible he was burned at the stake in 1536 because the charge was he had mixed from old testament and greek and hebrew a mixture was there in the new testament that he produced so for this charge he was even burned okay so later on many translations came which is given in detail on page 13 you can read it later so these things showed that the people of those times rejected La the latin language they rejected the latin language and they gave rise to vernacular languages the bible translations this was the key is issue so translation was used as a weapon to declined latin as a universal language thus we see how the political and historical events influence the growth and development of language and translation so we have to keep in mind literal translation and free translation so what is literal translation the word by word translation the free translation where sense for sense translation is taken into consideration then uh, we see that uh, why we should be translating the aims of translation are given on page 14 uh, you can read that why we should be translating you can read that that is very easy only for understanding so they say we have to clarify the errors for that translation is needed and then um, it should be in a, written in a satisfying vernacular style satisfying 
local style. For that, we have to resort to translation and then reduce the extent to which scriptures were interpreted and made available to the layman. So these were some of the aims for translating. It is given on page 14. You can refer to that later. So for the translators who came later, that is starting from the Renaissance Bible trans Renaissance Bible. See, we saw the different periods, okay? How, what were the Romans involved in and what were the people earlier were involved in? So for the translators who came later during the Renaissance period, translation meant fluidity, that is freeness. Free translation was advocated during the Renaissance period. Uh, free translation, freeness and intelligibility in the sense it should be understandable to everybody. Understanding and comprehensi comprehensibility was emphasized. Comprehensibility of the target language was very, very important for them. Also was important fact that they should be literally accurate. Whatever is translated from the source text should be literally accurate in the target text, target language. So thus we see that uh, religion played a very important role in uh, translation process. Now coming to the theorists, early theorists were there who uh, brought about the print, uh, that is with the ad adv advent of printing technology in the 15th century. Printing technology brought about a change in translation process. It brought about a revolution in the role of translation and in the function of learning. One of the first writers to formulate theory of translation. See, now we, after looking at the history of translation, we are now moving to the theory of translation. Okay. So the first writers, one of the first writers to formulate a formal theory of translation is Etienne Dolet. He is a French humanist who was actually tried and executed for mistranslating one of Plato's dialogues. He was tried and executed for that, but he had given an outline of translation principles. Sorry for that interruption. Hope I'm audible to everybody. Um, yeah. So we we were looking at how religion played an important role. So we have come away from that and we are now moving on to the early theorists, the people who propounded theories for this translation. Okay. So uh, we can see that... Uh, this printing technique, no, it brought about a revolution uh, in, in the role of translation and in the function of learning. So one of the first writers to formulate theory of translation is Etienne Dolet. Etienne Dolet is a French humanist who was actually executed for mistranslating Plato's dialogues. One of Plato's dialogues was mistranslated by him and he was tried and executed for that. So Dolet, in his outline of translation principles, he has given some principles, brought out five principles for the translator. So he said that the translator should understand the sense and meaning of the original author. So he said that the sense and meaning, see, 
you have the source text and you have the target language target text st and tt you have to please remember this okay the source language sl and the target language so whatever sense is conveyed whatever sense and whatever meaning is conveyed in the source text is all it should be there in the target text should be there in the translated text by target text i mean translated text okay mm -hmm. so what uh, etienne dolet proposed is a translator should understand the sense and meaning of the original author what the original author was trying to put forth avar enna solla verumbraro avaroda sense and meaning should be there in the text translated okay so suppose the person who is translating uh, do, has not understood certain things of the original author then it lies in him to get things clarified he if if things are unclear to him if things are obscure to him then he can get it clarified okay so that is the first point that the translator should understand the sense and meaning of the original author then the translator should have very good knowledge about the source language and the target language see earlier i told you that uh, a translator should be proficient in both the source language and the target language so he should be well versed in these two languages uh, so th this person who is going to be a translator should have very good knowledge of both these languages okay then what dolet is telling is the person who is translating should definitely avoid word to word translation the person who is translating should not go for word to word translation because when you try to go for word to word translation the aestheticness of the work of art might be lost okay so they say try to avoid word for word translation and uh, the person who is translating the fourth point is the person who is translating should use common forms of speech okay so there should be common use of the forms of speech and uh, the last point that uh, dolet suggests is the words should be chosen in a very appropriate manner the word should be chosen in a very appropriate manner and the word should be ordered in a very appropriate manner so considering these points put forth by dolet we understand that etienne dolet the french humanist is emphasizing on the perfect understanding of the source text see if you have a need to translate a text a textbook then you should not only know the language of language in which the original text is written but also you should know the language in which you are going to translate that and you should have a perfect understanding of the source text okay so for translating if you are going to attempt a translation the person who is translating should be a competent linguist proficient in both the languages so the person should also be a very scholarly person a person who can uh, easily face all these things easily get cleared of all the doubts that he has because he has to carry out whatever is given in the source text to the target text in a perfect manner okay so that essence should not be lost that meaning should not be lost that sense should not be lost so the translator should take proper care in carrying this out so the um, the person who is attempting at translation should be able to appreciate the source text in a very sensitive manner and should carry that out perfectly well in the target language so from source text we translate it to the target text so the uh, the equivalent should be arrived at 
the person who is translating should establish a equivalence of both the texts both the text uh, both the source text as well as the uh, target text should be equal okay although we do not involve in word to word translation we should see to that uh, an equivalence is established between these two texts okay so dolets views were repeated by george chapman too so this is given on page 16 dolets views were reiterated repeated by george chapman too so who is this george Chap chapman george chapman is a great translator of homer so he translated homer and in his epistle epistle means letter epistle means letter so in his epistle chapman states that a translator must not use word to word renderings you should not use word for word rendering word for word translation and that the spirit of the original text should be there the the, the spirit of the original text should be there means what an equivalence should be brought about between the original text and the translated text between the source text and the target text okay so and also loose translation should be avoided the translator should use his scholarliness the person should make a very strong scholarly investigation and uh, loose translations should be avoided this much is clear next we see north's translation of plutarch uh, so this is a very famous one plutarch the works of plutarch was translated by north and uh, shakespeare relied a lot upon these sources so north emphasizes on using contemporary idiom same went with white and sare who belong to the same period so north white and sare they all emphasized on the usage of contemporary idioms for translating any text so critics what they did is since people um started i mean people relied a lot upon using contemporary idioms critics called these as adaptations okay critics called these translated works as adaptations so from all these history and examples that we saw translation is not a secondary activity but it is a primary one you understand we should not regard translation as a, a secondary activity but a primary one and equal importance should be given to the original text and the translated text for that only translators should take immense care in providing uh, authenticity of the original text the source text and the target text should be equal so what is source text the language from which we are going to translate and what is target language into which we are going to translate okay suppose we are going to translate an Eng english novel into tamil the english version the english novel will be the source text and the tamil one into which we are going to translate tamil or hindi whatever that will be the target language why i repeat these two words source text source language target text target languages because these are important terms in this paper this paper translation these are the two key terms important terms which you should be remembering okay so that is why this point is being reiterated here right so so far we have been looking at the history of translation so far what we have been looking is we saw what a translation is what is translation actually efforts were being made to define translation and uh, from which word greek word this uh word came up the etymology of the word translation we saw that 
and then we saw the different lines of approach to translation we saw that translation established itself from roman tradition and then we saw the classification of translation we saw how george steiner in his book after babel classified translation okay he made four tra classifications he made four classifications we saw in detail what those four classifications were and then we also saw how the romans contributed to the uh, translation huh? what is source language what is target language all these things and we also saw that translators should not blindly follow the rules of translation blindly work make uh, word for word translation but it should be a kind of sense for sense translation and we also saw how the romans emphasized on the autonomy or independence of the translated text okay and then we saw how um, uh, religion uh, how translation became the affair of the state how translation became the affair of the religion a matter of religion it was with the spread of christianity that the dissemination of bible uh, gathered momentum and it was uh, the attempt at translating the bible that uh, translation started gaining momentum okay this holy text was translated into the different vernacular languages and how uh, he, uh, william tindale lost his life also uh in the attempt at translating so we also saw the goal of translation why translation should be made the aim of translation and um, about the early theories that were produced by the early theorists so we saw how printing techniques uh contributed to the production of translation so we saw dolet's views in um Uh, dolet's views in translation okay so now uh, we also saw how george chapman also um, uttered the same views as that of dolet's and then north's translation of pluta now coming to the 17th century coming to the 17th century we have this great writer john denham john denham he advocates or rather it should be said that he wants people making word for word translation vaarthaiku vaartha translate pandrathu that he was against okay he was against he want people making word for word translation that is literal translation he advocated free translation he said do not go for word for word translation but go for free translation because he says why it would not suit word for word translation is it will not suit poetry it will not suit poetry so the translator should not only translate language to language but also poetry to poetry so he feels a new spirit should be infused in the translation otherwise the text will be a lifeless one hope you all understand see when you read a work of art it should be full of life it should bring before your eyes what the author means okay it shouldn't be lifeless so um, john denham believes that when word for word translation is made then there is every possibility that the work of art which we are trying to translate will lose its charm with lose will lose its aestheticness will lose its life it will appear dead okay so nobody would like to read a very unenthusiastic work nobody would like to read an unenthusiastic word so for that the translation that is to be made should not be um uh, should not follow word for word translation instead it should be a free translation the translator should not only translate language to language but also poetry to poetry he feels that a new spirit should be infused into poetry so to infuse a new spirit into poetry 
the translator should be a scholarly person the translator should perfectly understand the sense the meaning the essence of the source text he should be able to enjoy the source text he should be well versed in the source text that is why uh, that alone will give life to the text that is he, that he is going to translate so this is what the 17th century is telling okay so um, john denham uh, he in his poem to sir richard forshaw expresses this in the preface okay so he uh, tells that it should not be without life and he says that the translator's business is not alone to translate language into language but poetry into poetry otherwise it will be lifeless he says see he argues a concept of translation that sees a translator and original writer as equals see he says that uh, that we cannot consider the original writer as a superior person and the translator as an inferior person no it is not like that both the writers are equals the translator and the original writer are equal but where does the difference lie the difference lies in the operation levels they operate on differentiated social and temporal contexts so one writer what is temporal temporal means related to time social the society so the original writer may belong to a different society he may belong to a different historical period and the translator might belong to a different society and to a different historical period so both of them are equals only both are of the same stand only but they operate on differentiated social and temporal context so this point we have to remember so john denham sees the translator as reproducing or recreating the essential core of source text into the target text so john denham he says both the original writer and the translating writer translator are equal and um, uh, but the difference lies only in bringing out the essence the translator has to take care while reproducing while re creating because he has attempted in recreating the essential core of the source text the original text so it should not lose its charm it is the translator's duty to bring to achieve to extract what he finds in that original text what the translator sees in that original text should be brought to the target language what the translator sees in the source text should be brought to the target text source text is the original and the target text is the recreation the translated work okay next coming to abraham cowley who was period is 1618 to 67 he in his pindaric odes in his preface to pindaric odes very sweetly says about translation he says he asserts in fact he says i have taken left out and added what i please so to this is simply put as taken left out and added what i please okay so um, while translating he says while translating he has taken something from the source text he has let, left out something from the source text and added to the target text whatever he wished to add okay very simple taken left out and added what i please so he have why he is telling this is while writing the target text while translating he has done it according to his own terms that is what abraham cowley says so um, this was actually taken as a manifesto of liberal translations of the latter 17th century whoever came after abraham cowley took this as the manifesto okay they took this as the manifesto 
what is it? taken left out and added okay so then then came john dryden who bel who belonged to the period 1631 to 1700 so um, john dryden in his important preface to ovid's epistles so in this preface he tackled the problems of translations by formulating three basic types okay so uh, he formulated three types one is metaphrase the other one is paraphrase and the third one is imitation see you have to be very careful metaphrase paraphrase and imitation what is this metaphrase metaphrase is word by word translation you translate a piece of work line by line from one language into another from source language sl into target language tl so you translate word by word line by line that is called as metaphrase then what is this paraphrase paraphrase is not word by word but sense for sense translation free translation word by word na literal translation sense for sense na it is the free translation so this is what dryden and preferred also and this paraphrasing actually was considered superior compared to the other two dryden ignored metaphrase and imitation and uh, he adopted paraphrasing okay so paraphrasing is sense for sense view of translation you would have uh, in in many uh, uh, notes and all no like Uh, if you uh, for shakespeare's plays and all for better understanding when we uh, look at the grocery notes and all we have this paraphrase okay sense for sense translation where they try to describe expound put in simple terms so the, this thing is called as paraphrasing and the third one that john dryden formulated is imitation imitation is where the translator can leave away the original text he can actually abandon the original text as he likes to and adapt his own this is almost like adaptation so john dryden found the second one was a balanced one among the three metaphrase paraphrase and imitation john dryden found paraphrasing a better one and he adopted himself to using paraphrasing and um, that is sense for sense kind of translation so here here again uh, he says like the translator should be a master of both the languages should be a master of both the languages means what should be a master of both the source language sl and target language tl okay so the person who is translating should be a master of both the languages and the original essence the spirit of the original should be captured okay the the spirit which was there in the source language source text that should be captured and rendered in the target language tl and uh, the author who is trying to translate a piece of work should retain the aesthetics of the original so the the resemblance to the original should be there maintaining the resemblance of the original should be there so pope followed dryden in this alexander pope followed dryden in this kind of translating that is what is given in or given on page 19 okay so pope also advocated the same he also followed dryden uh, in his translations now coming to the 18th century coming to the 18th century 18th century saw translation as more powerful attempt translator was seen as more powerful okay uh, why translator is was seen as more powerful is because he has a moral duty towards the original subject why he is looked at as being more powerful was he has a moral duty towards the original subject so john dryden rejected word for word versions that is 
he rejected metaphrase he, re he did not use imitation also imitations that adapt the foreign text so that was actually followed by his followers then comes another great literary personality wilhelm gathe he wanted a new concept of originality in translation gathe wanted a new concept of originality in translation so along with the vision of universal deep structures that the translator should work on to achieve uh, a new concept of originality in the sense he proposed that the translator should not only retain the original resemblance uh, should retain the re um, resemblance to originality but also try to transcreate it with his own scholarliness with his own um, skills so along with a vision of universal deep structures that the translator should work on to achieve a concept of originality is also emphasized upon so in 1791 that is at the end of 18th century alexander fraser titler published the principles of translation so this is what we saw no like uh, uh, we saw in the work of dolet when dolet had uh, when dolet had given certain uh, classifications the four classifications he made no in that uh, the first uh, in that the first classification he brought about uh, this person's name titlers he brings about titlers principles of translation so this work the principles of translation is the first systematic study of translation processes it is uh, given on page 21 so here fraser titler alexander fraser titler says that translation should be a complete transcript of the idea of the original work it should be a complete transcript okay it should not deviate from the original one it should not deviate from the source text it should be a transcript of the target text the style should be like the original the manner of writing should be like the original so it should not deviate away from the original work and when a translator is translating he should see to it that care is taken to have the same ease of the original composition the same ease the same flexibility that is found in the original text should be there in the translated text also so titler said that tra that the translated text the target text should give the same force and effect of the original what effect what force is found in the original text what so uh, force is found in the source text should also get reflected in the target text okay so the soul of the original author should be visible in it that is what titler tells in the principles of translation so all that the 18th century was bothered about was recreating the essential spirit of the original work they emphasized these 18th century people these 18th century critics and writers emphasized the fact that the essential spirit of the original work should be recreated with freedom for the author the the author should recreate the essence the original spirit with his own freedom he should be free enough to bring about the original uh, spirit of the original author okay so this is all about uh, 17th century and 18th century and now coming to the romanticism period romanticism period romantics okay on page 22 here we can see that uh, two conflicting views were seen among the romanticists the romanticists saw translation as a creative genius they exalted the translator as a creative genius so one thing is they saw translators also as creative writers they exalted the translators as creative geniuses and another thing is 
mechanical function so two contradictory or two conflictive conflicting views one is they saw them as a creative genius saw the translator as a creative genius another is they saw it as a mechanical function of uh, making known a text or an author to another language introducing an author or a text of one language to the readers of another language so these two views were expressed in the romantic period okay so um, this is in the romanticism period and what happened after romanticism post romanticism so in the post romanticism period we have this um, german frederick schleimakers okay his 1813 lecture given in berlin academy of sciences here uh, he says a good translation gives importance to the foreigners foreignness in the text okay schleimakers comments that a good translation gives importance to the foreignness in the text there should be something foreign in the text so that he gives importance to and um, schleimakers theory of a separate translation language was uh, shared by a number of 19th century english translators also so some of the english translators of that uh, post romanticism period are newman carlyle william morris so he emphasized on the foreignness in the text that is for post romanticism and then coming to the victorian period among the victorian translators you have arnold arnold is in his first lecture on translating homer so arnold um, gave a lecture on translating homer here arnold says that the translator must primarily focus on the source language so the uh, he is not bothered about the outcome that is it is not he is not bothered about but he says that the translator must carefully focus on the source language on the source text okay so that is matthew arnold's views and then we have henry longfellow's views henry longfellow says that the translator should simply report what is there in the source language and not explain it okay so uh, longfellow says that the um, business of the translator is only to report what the source language author says but not to explain means he says the person who is translating need not interpret that work need not comment that on that work but simply state what that original writer is has attempted to state so he says there is no need to explain what the original writer was trying to mean but it is enough if you simply report what that author was trying to say okay uh, so this is longfellow's view but um, this view of longfellow was simply pushed to the position of, position of a technician so he was he is only a technician so even a machine can translate that isn't it from one language to another a machine also can translate it simply so it is more technical longfellow's uh, views are more uh, technical oriented he is neither a poet there neither a, nor a commentator there and uh, that states how limited that work would be that simply reporting what the original writer is trying to say no that thing is simply um reporting and not trying to uh, add any aestheticness into it so that was the view of longfellow now comes edward fitzgerald edward fitzgerald is a writer who translated the rubaiyat of omar khayyam so here we can see that uh, fitzgerald is trying to contrast the opinion given by longfellow 
he contrasts the opinion given by longfellow he says source language text must be brought to the target language culture as a living entity so fitzgerald says that um, the source language text should be brought to the target language culture what is there in the source language what is there in the source text must be taken to the culture of the target language so the that uh, source language languages culture should be known to the people who are reading the translated work target language culture as a living entity he says um so earlier also we saw that uh, if word to word translation is made then the life in it would be lost it would become lifeless like that here we see that uh, fitzgerald is also trying to emphasize that uh, if we try to um you know make this kind of translation then uh, life would be lost in it okay now coming to the 20th century writings so 20th century writings it is given on page 26 see uh, before going to the 20th century we will just look at what is given on page 25 see um, um, this 20th century you know it was marked with uh, uh, two world wars and a number of wars had taken place uh, industrial capitalism it saw the rise of industrial capitalism colonial expansion etc okay so during those times during these two world wars and during the time of cap industrial uh, capitalism and colonial expansion what were the views of translation so here some five points are given huh? where the um, view is that translation is a scholarly activity it is the activity of a scholar where the preeminence of the source text is assumed over any target language version so they say it is a scholar's activity and only a well versed scholar a well versed a, a person who is proficient in both the languages in both source language and target language should take up this kind of translation work then translation as a means of encouraging the intelligent reader to in return to the source language original so it um, when you read a text what the second point means is when you read a text in the target language when you read a translated work it should encourage the reader it should uh, incite the feeling in the reader to immediately go to the source language it should uh, incite the curiosity it should arouse the curiosity of the reader to go to the so original language to go to the source language and it should be a means of helping the target language reader become the equal of what schlemaker called the better reader of the original so here no like these uh, these um, points are emphasizing the fact that the translator translated text should create a curiosity in the readers to go to the source language to go to the original language in which the text is written and uh, the translation as a means whereby the individual translator offers his own choice of meaning meaning to the target language reader so getting the meaning from target language that is uh, stated here and um, the translator should also seek to upgrade the status of the source language text so um, if you know if the original text is uh, seen at a lower cultural level then the translator should attempt at upgrading the status of the source language text okay so these um, 
uh, among these five categories no that was in practice during the two world wars and during the industrial capitalism period that is during the colonial expansion uh, among these five categories that is stated here we can see that uh, the types 1 and 2 where you know it is stated that uh, translation is a scholar's activity and uh, translation should encourage the reader to go to the source language uh, in these two tech in these two points we say in these two points we see that there is a tendency to see it can be seen that type 1 and 2 would tend to produce very literal translations accessible to a learned minority so only literal translations are made in first and second point they say and uh, whereas you know the fourth one individual translator translation as a means whereby the individual translator offers his own choices of meaning to the target language reader and the last point as a mean where the translator seeks to upgrade the status of the source language in these last two points it leads to much freer translation space so the first two points state that translations are um literal translations that is word to word translation where the translator is not having much freedom okay just translating word by word whereas the last two points fourth and fifth one they suggest that the translators are more free that they can even alter the source language text that they can even change the source language the third category would produce translations full of archaisms of form and language and it is this method that was so strongly attacked by arnold c we saw that 1 and 2 stressed on literal translations 4 and 5 stressed on free translations what is there in the middle what is there in the middle that is translation as a means of helping the target language reader become the equal of what uh, the original author that is both uh, the translator and the original work writer are equal that aspect that aspect is what was opposed by arnold because it consists of archaisms of form and language okay now coming to um 20th century in addition to word for word translation and uh, sentence to sentence translation one minute i am having some interruption okay coming to 20th century um, views on translation we have in addition to word for word translation sentence to sentence translation something called as conceptual translations so during this 20th century other approaches were brought in other methods of translations were brought in so among the other methods of translations other approaches of translations we have communicative and semantic approaches so communicative you know making people understand what you are trying to tell communicative approach and semantic approach is the approach in meaning of what we want to say so communicative and semantic approaches so in communicative approach the effect of on readers is close as that was on source language see you have you have some you have the source language text and when you translate that source language text it becomes the target language text okay so in communicative approach the effect on readers is 
almost equal or is almost close to the source language text what effect is produced while reading the source language text that effect is got that same effect is got in while reading the target language text also while reading the translated text also you get the same effect as that of reading the source language text hope you understand this see you have two different approaches communicative approach and semantic approach so while reading the commu this communicative approach in communicative approach the effect is closer to that of reading the source language text okay whereas in semantic approach uh, it might be a accurate this approach may be accurate but may not communicate well okay semantic and st syntactic structures are close to the source language text hope you understand you have two approaches communicative approach and semantic approach in the semantic approach no which gives importance to the semantic and syntactic structures which gives importance to the vocabulary which gives importance to the sentence structures so when we when when the person who is translating when the translator is giving importance to uh, semantic and uh, semantic and syntactic structures then it might be that those aspects might be close to the source language those aspects might be close to the source language uh, but it may not be very accurate it may not communicate well so this is the difference between these two approaches uh, if communicative approach is adopted then communication may be good it may communicate well but it may not be precise but semantic approach might be precise but it may not communicate well hope i am clear to you these two approaches state that semantic approach may be accurate but may not communicate well but communicative approach may communicate well but may not be precise okay so that is the difference between these two approaches now coming to so the, these things are given on page uh, 27 now coming to the 20th century uh, personality new Ma new mark he proposes three basic translation processes new mark proposes three basic translation processes he does uh, 1988 okay so here it is on page 29 so he says new mark says interpretation and analysis of the source language text see an important aspect of translation that experts have attended to is the translation processes so new mark contends that there are three basic translation processes so what are the three basic translation processes one is analyzing and interpreting the original text sl means source language text original text in which language the original the first version was written so analyzing interpretation and analysis of the source language text second one is translation procedure uh translation procedure where you know you have to choose the words and sentences that will be appropriate for the target language choosing equivalent words not any words the words that will be equivalent to the words that are used in the source language so one is interpretation and analysis of the source language text second one is a procedure of translation choosing words and sentences for target language the language in which we are going to translate and then the reformulation of the text according to the writer's intention reformulating see the person who is going to translate the translator must have read the source language text must have read the original text and then he has to 
be a scholarly person he has to be a scholar who is very proficient in both the languages he has to take immense care in choosing the words in choosing the sentences which will be appropriate which will be equivalent to the writer's intention to the original writer's intention and also you know um, the language into which he is going to translate the intention the expectation of the readers okay the, he has to fulfill the expectation of the readers and the appropriate norms of the target language so these are three important points that newmark has given in 1988 the three basic translation processes interpretation and analysis of the source text translation procedure and reformulation of the text according to the writer's intention the third point yes the reformulation of text according to the writer's intention see when uh, when when the translator attempts to translate he has to keep up the original spirit of the original text he has to keep up the spirit of the original text he has to take immense care in keeping up the writer's intention why did he intend to write that so uh, that has to be brought in the text that is to be translated okay so that one and then the expectation of the reader what the reader is expecting from that translated work that he has to formulate reformulate okay and um, the norms of the target language norms in the sense of stylistics semantics syntactic grammar all these norms also should be appropriated properly in the target language so while translating the translator has a big task has a big responsibility in trying to keep up the or, uh, spirit of the original text in trying to uh, in 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 uh, for sure understanding the original writer's intention and the expectation of the readers and also you know uh, he should have analyzed interpreted properly what the original uh, text was trying to uh, propose or uh, was trying to tell so all and also added to all these the target languages norms grammar syntax lexical all those things okay so that also should be kept in mind so this is what the great linguist or the great uh, critic newmark proposed during the 20th century so this period this 20th century uh, saw the linguists literary critics philosophers all join joining in a remarkable unity of interest in translation as a problem of language and culture see it all translation started as a very simple affair it started with the translation of the holy book the bible buddhist scriptures were translated so initially beginning its journey with translating the religious scriptures it is now during the contemporary period it is seen as a problem of language and culture because much importance were given to equivalence equivalence in the sense the source text source language text and the target language text should be equals should be equivalent to lexical grammatical and scientific uh, stylistic analysis so a big challenge is there in front of the uh, translators because of the problem of language and culture also because while translating a text there will come the problem of misrepresentation as i told you there was a critic there was a translator who was tried and executed for uh, mis translating dialogues okay plato's dialogues so while translating immense care should be taken not to misrepresent anything okay this should be kept in mind so that is what is being discussed 
in under the subtopic uh, 20th century uh, mostly based on what type of text and what social function it plays that also it should be it should keep in mind the type of text that is being translated whether it is a religious text or whether it is a anthropology uh, some writings on anthropology or whether is a, it is a historical uh, text see a translation can be anything uh, e whether it is a scientific report so translating scientific work and all will be easy because the spirit of it will be the scientific spirit will automatically get into it but coming to literary works there are a lot of problems involved in literary translation you know the difference between literal and literary literal word to word word to word translations literary uh, you know the genres that are involved in it okay poetry drama short story novel all these things the the different genres in english literature so when a person is translating he should um, uh, keep in mind what type of text he is going to translate what social function the text is going to play etc so thus we have been looking at the history of translation down the ages okay now uh, coming to page uh, 50 you should recollect uh, ma madam has given uh, that some of the topics for short notes also what to, who's a translator what does interpretation means what is a source text what is target text imitation etc and then some essay topics also are given just see if uh, uh, you have understood these things see the first essay topic is give a comprehensive history of translation theories and practice down the ages which we have just now discussed and uh, we are yet to go on to the second third fourth and fifth one okay fifth one uh, we have finished define this translation and uh, fourth one also to some extent we have covered what is a translator's role in enriching his own language we are yet to see that and uh, now you know on page um, 30 there are there is a sub topic which states the problems in literary translation so while uh, translating poetry see as i told you it's easy to translate a scientific experiment or some other things you know in um, which are very impersonal and those things will be easy to translate but when it comes to literary work when it comes to translation of poetry fiction and drama the translators face a number of problems uh problems in literary translation the different genres poetry drama short story novel translation cannot be completely free or completely li literal so you have to strike a balance between free translation and uh, literal translation you cannot make it completely literal also so it is subject to socio cultural factors from both the source and target systems so literary translation is a translation of varying literary genres okay so here they have stated the different problems that we are going to see so in the next few classes we i'll just discuss all these things because i was asked to handle only one hour and um but and for i mean um, do they have may uh, altered the arrangement later on it seems i have to handle another all are also so um, any doubts so far so translators know they find uh, translating poetry dif uh, difficult actually compared to other genres uh, translating poetry is considered to be difficult because of the figures of speech um, that it involves okay
yeah sorry for that interruption now uh, coming uh, if you have the books with you or if you have the material with you you can simply go to page 30 31 where they say every literary genre has its specific translation problems um uh, especially you know this po poetry why because poems uh, forms uh, forms consists of um, the various poetic techniques no like uh, you have the metaphors you have similes you have rhythms you have assonances so while translating all these things there might arise the problem of capturing the spirit of the original work while translating poetry there might ar 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 arise the problem of capturing the original essence the capturing the spirit of the original author because of the various techniques that are involved in the poetic devices okay because of the devices uh, we might be into a lot of uh, problem and there is um, like what are the problems we'll just see uh, one by one first one is direct access to the or original direct access to the original this is a common problem while translating poetry because it consists of giving a critical apparatus prepared for a poem allowing people not particularly focused in the language so while interpreting interpreting the text you know through clarification meaning or not there will be a chance for us to deviate from the original and the so uh, direct access to the original uh, stands as an obstacle for the uh, target uh, uh, text okay and then an internal translation with parallel text what does this means giving both the text side by side on the printed page sometime you know while uh, translating while uh, making paraphrase one page will consist of the uh the uh, the right hand side i mean the left hand side page will consist of the original text you have two pages right one page will have the original text and the other page will have the translated one in that sense uh um, when people start comparing no the original with the translated version the source text with the target text then um satisfying uh, paraphrasing they may not get so that you know that will lead to some trouble and uh, philological translation a translation that does not consider the readability of the text that is produced philological adherence to the proto text the source text okay so the the aim of such translation is to give access to the original for readers unable to access it that is if we are unable to have the original text with us and we are given only this then we have this problem of philological translation and they talk about a single dominant translation so this again talks about the superficial analysis of the original text of the source text so for uh, examination no they will uh, questions will be like this also uh what are the problems faced by the translator of poetry what are the problems faced by the translator of drama so um, the writer of this text has beautifully given all these things uh, madam has in fact underlined the main points also which will give you an idea huh? um so a poetic translation or author's translation that is the last point in this the translation is given in the receiving culture of the poet so when translating a poem see if it is a um, prose no if it is a prose or drama it um, uh, we will be uh, uh, reading in a lengthy manner and um, it, um, it may not be that very difficult for us to you know get the culture that is portrayed by the uh, translator 
but uh, when it comes to translating poems brevity is there it will be very brief implications will be there which we have to understand with a careful reading so those times it will be a little problematic for us okay for the comprehension of the poem uh, it will be a little difficult uh, because of the poetic devices and the figurative languages that are uh, involved in it okay so that is what is given on page 34 um the rhythm rhyme meter specific expressions and structures that may not conform to the ones of the daily language so poem is different from the language that we use for conversation isn't it so um, uh, that will uh, give us some trouble in comprehension they say okay so now coming to the dissimilarities between the source language and target language poetical forms present a challenge to verse translators v e r s e verse translators poetic translators okay because every language even tamil you know uh, sayul will be sayul which is the poetic form will be little difficult for us to understand despite us being proficient in uh, tamil so like that uh, in english also the verse form will be little difficult even for the native speakers if that is the case for native speakers then where of you know for the translators so to capture the essence the spirit of poetry that is difficult for translators they say especially to the translators of poetry for example you know you have uh, the different um, in poetry itself you have the different forms namely sonnet ballad elegy ode etc so sonnet is a poem consisting of 14 lines which are divided into three quatrains and a couplet with rhymes a b a b and all so when you translate a poem when you translate a sonnet it will be difficult for us to keep up that rhyme scheme that a b a b scheme the rhyme scheme that is uh, there in the original poem okay so these are some of the uh, problems some of the difficulties faced by the translators of verse so it is very challenging task translating poetry into a target language from source language is a difficult task because extreme care should be taken to retain the original essence of the original poem okay so because of the poetic devices and because of the techniques involved in poems they say it is very difficult to translate poetry and then um the differences in metrical patterns all these okay the plurality in meanings all these pose different challenges so why is it um, difficult to translate poems because uh, in free verse that is in prose the translator will be at liberty to choose whatever words but here he should take care in retaining the metrical patterns in retaining the um, exact meaning that the original writer has intended and in retaining the um, form of the poem whether it is a ballad or a you know whether it is a ballad or a sonnet or an elegy or a ode he has to retain the original form so all these things lead to and the different uh, figures of speech is also no like uh, because of all these things it poses a big challenge to the uh, translators of verse translators of poetry okay so it is given elaborately um up to page 42 43 okay why is it difficult to translate a poem poetry why is it difficult to translate poetry you all can please go through that if you have any doubts you can ask me in the next class and um okay uh they have also given in this chapter 
the translation of non fictional prose non fictional prose what is non fictional prose the prose written uh, by journalists the technical writing so non fictional prose refers to the technical writing journalistic writing scientific writing okay so here the role of the translator is very minimal it is a very formal uh, kind of writing so um, uh, there is no need for the writer to you know have the appropriate emotion that is needed for the poetry translation okay so here the uh, for this kind of formal translation formal work for this kind of uh, translation of journalistic writings or scientific reports and all emphasis is given on accuracy okay emphasis is given on accuracy then the translation for fiction fiction again uh, a little easy only but here socio semiotic approach is needed they say when the the writers the translators have to be careful about the social scenario the cultural scenario in which that original uh, fiction was written okay so he has to take in mind uh, uh, the social scenario and the cultural scenario and uh, should take immense care in avoiding any kind of um, misrepresentation any kind of misrepresentation of culture because that will lead to problem and uh, translating drama texts also okay drama texts you know it is performance it is a work of the theater so here again uh, when translating drama you, you know in drama uh, silences will be meaningful sometimes um speech will be meaningless so uh, here again you have a lot of techniques uh, that the director will be uh, paying attention to it so each genre will have its own problems and troubles which the translator has to keep in mind and um, you know translate accordingly so in this chapter we have been looking at uh we initially started with um we initially see the uh, if we talk about the problems that are faced by the translators then the literary translator will be facing linguistic problem linguistic problem in the sense language problem literary problem there is a difference between literal meaning and literary meaning hope you understand so literary problem and then capturing the aesthetic nature of that original text and then the socio cultural problem so all these problems are there um all these are given in detail in the text so after looking at the history of translation after looking at the definition of translation history of translation we had just gone through the um, uh, problems faced in the different uh, centuries and the problems faced in translating the different genres in literature so with this i stop and this with this we finish off we complete unit 1 and in the next class we'll move on to unit 2 okay any doubts you can please ask me in the next class thank you